What's up, everybody? This is Ricardo Rodriguez. And Matthew Messick. And this is the Profits Over Wages Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Profits Over Wages Podcast, where we do weekly interviews with highly successful business owners and entrepreneurs. We discuss life, business, and entrepreneurship to bring forward the lessons learned from success and failure, and most importantly, have fun while doing it. On episode 39 of the podcast, we sit down with Emil Kodopkowski. Emil immigrated from Russia to the United States at the age of 10. He started at an entry-level position at a mortgage company, quickly advanced, and ultimately became a partner at the firm. During that time, he began investing in real estate through private trust deeds, as well as the acquisition of performing and non-performing notes. In 2011, he started Forbix, establishing a commercial mortgage bank, a direct lending platform for private debt, in an acquisition and development arm, all under one roof. On this episode, we go in depth about financing real estate projects, both commercial and residential. Emil talks about the growing pains of starting and growing a company. And from a lender's perspective, Emil shares his thoughts on the current state of the real estate market. Enjoy the show. So thanks, Emil, for being, uh, for taking time out of your schedule to, you know, let Let's do this interview. For those of our audience who are not familiar with you, can you let them know what uh, what it is that you do and uh, know who you are? Sure. Uh, I'm a principal at Forbix Financial, uh, or Forbix, which is a mortgage bank and an investment company, uh, essentially for residential and commercial real estate. And uh, we do residential, commercial, and we do private equity investments and properties as well as uh, construction projects. Nice. You founded the company, correct? Yeah, I formed the company back in 2011, and uh, prior to that, I was a partner in a different firm for about 10 years before I formed this one, and uh, pretty much. So yeah, so how did that how did that come about? You know, why did you decided uh, to found Forbix with your partners? Well, I think uh, you know, I think uh, opportunity presents itself in, in in weird times for different people. It maybe it wasn't the best time to open up a new company, but I felt it was the right time for me. And uh, the reason why we did it is because uh, I really wanted to have uh, uh, an opportunity for every type of investor to be able to, I guess, benefit from us. And you know, we kind of talk about it quite a bit. Uh, the, f- the first time a person's coming in to buy a house, we want to accommodate them. Next one is an investment property. But then eventually they make some money, they buy an apartment building uh, or invest in private securities, which is what we do as well. And uh, eventually, maybe they'll get into development projects, whether individually or with us in partnership. And so we wanted to kind of have it all uh, grow with our clients, because that's the same way that we grow ourselves. We just preach, we practice. We've done it in our own small fix and flips to single family development, the ground up construction, buying non-performing notes, that's and building projects ranging from you know five units to 50 units. Uh, we've done it, and we we started from zero ourselves. Nobody ever said, "Hey, here's ten million bucks, go play." We made all the money ourselves from scratch and invested our own capital. And uh, eventually, other people, friends, family, other investors that have been with us for a long time, kind of uh, piggybacked on on our experience, and that's how we grew. We wanted the same thing for everybody else. Nice. And then around that time, because you founded it in 2011, you know, it's just a couple of years after the crash. Like, what was the um, the environment then, like, is that, you know, was that, some people would say that would be a bad time to kind of get involved in real estate, or how, how did that play out for you at the time? Probably was, but I think the, 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 everything kind of aligned to the right environment. We were buying assets. We were in distressed assets already, myself and a few partners of mine, the downturn. So we were just coming out of that, and uh, the landscape for lending was changing quite a bit. And, you know, brokers were being kind of weeded out of the business with all new compliance, regulation, et cetera. So I, I knew that we had to become a mortgage bank from that perspective to be able to sustain ourselves. And the other portion is we have to be able to be versatile, uh, do residential, do commercial, do development, do investments, and diversify. And in my mind, cash flow was a main game. So uh, I believed in the idea and I thought it was the right timing. Uh, I didn't look at market uh, factors because I think in general, when everybody's doing it, you should stop. <laughs> And when nobody is doing it, you should probably start. It's kind of like when the you know when, if the stocks reach a certain number, I think it's a little too late to buy that stock. You should have bought it you know five years ago. So it was, it was the same concept. We, we felt it was right for us. We had the capital to do it. And again, we started with four people and um, kind of grew our way from there. We're about thirty people now. 
Nice. Oh, nice. How do you how do you start a company in the past, or was this your first venture? Uh, you know, I was a partner of a firm that I helped grow, but it was the first uh, company that I started from zero. And why did you decide to do it? Like, did, was it like one of those? Like you, you said, it was just one of those things that just uh, an opportunity that just came by. You know, it was a, it was a conversation. You know, at the time when I was in a different partnership, uh, we just kind of saw different things. I wanted to go on kind of a, a steady growth and, and really expand quite a bit. And it wasn't necessarily aligned with uh, with my then partners. And I just said, you know, I have to just kind of do it on my own. And I didn't know where it's going to take us, but we're here today. So that was the reason why. And I and I think for for me. I think it was important to to be able to see things um, from a slightly different uh, view. Again, I looked at the technology into the future, different type of analytics, and, and our approach to investing and, and lending. So, because a lot of it isn't necessarily just doing the the agency loans, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA for conventional or com- or or commercial. It was also our own strategy for doing private investments, making loans, or getting into mezzanine financing, preferred equity. It was our own algorithms. It was our own uh, strategy. And uh, it seems to work. I mean, looking back in retrospect, 2012 or you know, 2011, 2012, yeah. that was like the best time to buy real estate after, you know, after the crash is when things were starting to, they were low enough, but not, you know, not those things started to pick up and pick up and pick up, you know, and you sure. know, not where we're at is, you know, it's, it's pretty up there, you know, compared right. to 2011, 2012. You know, I think it, and we were buying assets in stressed areas in around 2009, 2010, and 11. And around the time when I opened this up, 2011, 12, we were still buying non-performing debt because we felt that the properties were overvalued because of our strategy. Our, our, our strategy is, uh, you know, cash flow. And again, in hindsight, it's 2020. We should have bought a lot more assets and it would have gone up. But, you know, we're playing a very, very conservative approach. Around 2012, uh, 13, we started doing a lot more ground up construction because there were bigger margins than that, and not everybody else was doing it then. And now that market is heavily saturated as well. Forbrix is a lender, but it's also, you also have your own investments. Is it is it like a hybrid model, or do you have different divisions of the company? There are different divisions. They're unrelated. So Forbrix Capital is, is the residential and private debt model. Basically, we do uh, residential home loans uh, for people, investors. Our primary focus is investors, and, and some of the products we have are specifically geared toward investors with unlimited amount of properties financed, or as you know, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac will limit you at the 10 property. Um, and then uh, in regards to also uh, hybrid products, they're not necessarily, I don't want to call them stated income. They're just an alternative way to qualify them, meaning we have a, a profit and loss product, an asset-based product uh, that's quite unique. And uh, it allows people with decent rates, the rates are still around 5%. And people can buy a property without showing tax returns, uh, going off of a profit and loss statement, or just using their assets to qualify. So, you know, our, our products are unique to what we think is our uh, clientele. You know, we do have all of the above, you know, the regular first time home buyers. Uh, we do business with a lot of realtors, but in the same token, uh, probably 50 to 60% of our business are investors and they need structure. And in some cases, their taxes are too complicated to structure, and it's easier to go with one of the alternative products to get them in and out of the deal. Uh, we also lend to LLCs, where a lot of people want to lend to um, only individuals, and that gives us the ability to kind of have a, a bit of an edge on the conventional competition. Uh, that's Forbix Capital. Also through Forbix Capital, we do private debt and the servicing of private loans. So we currently, um, you know, we make the loans. We, we deal with brokers, of course. Brokers bring us the business and our own individual salespeople. And then we service them. Uh, and then um, that's, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, a circle. So we make a private loan uh, to an individual uh, or a company, and eventually they stabilize the property and they need to do a refinance. Well, then we have either the conventional um, side or else on the commercial, uh, Forbix Financial is a, is a direct lender. We do um, mostly apartment building loans. About probably 70% of our business is apartment building and 30% of everything else. And both for existing properties and ground construction uh, nationwide. And for Bix Ventures, that's the arm where I feel like we've grown into a, um, an opportunistic money partner to experienced developers. So our typical strategy is we find a great local developer builder who has some skin in the game in the project and is extremely experienced and has a good handle on the market. And we come in as our money partner and we'll do some sort of a, a, you know percentage of profit sharing. And then in many cases, we don't really have a strategy we're happy to develop the property, grow it, and then keep it. Huh. And, and then that's on the, the commercial side? 
Uh, yes, on the commercial side mostly. On, on the single family side, if we do end up developing a house, I mean, the best strategy is, of course, to, to sell the house. It's a lot of loan products. <laughs> I'm sorry? It's a lot of loan products. We're, a, we're geared of- as, a, as a lender, <laughs> more or less. Even, even when we do our investments uh, into projects, let's say we uh, partner up with a developer to build an apartment building. Let's just say it's uh, 100 units. We are, our goal is to put in the equity, make a certain minimum return on our investment, and then do an equity split. So the developer, a general contractor, will make a higher percentage than we will because you know, he or she is the one doing the heavy lifting. Right. You know, they're doing all the management, et cetera. And we're more concerned about the downside than about the upside. And typically local people that are in control of the project are more concerned about the upside. So we've done these projects uh, in Texas, in Georgia, uh, in California, and in uh, Washington State, in, in the, you know, the West Coast, Seattle area. I also saw that you are direct lenders for FHA apartment and construction loans. There's only about 100 lenders nationwide with that designation. Uh-huh. Um, can you go more into more detail about that? Or? Sure. sure. Yeah, of course. I mean, we're, we're, we're a HUD lender, uh, FHA. And so a lot of people uh, know Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and FHA as a conventional residential loan. But all of those three uh, companies have a very, very large commercial division. And they all essentially uh, either guarantee or buy the paper uh, from us when it comes to what we call agency debt. So the unique factor of FHA uh, for the apartment side, a lot of people think of FHA and think affordable. Um, there is a component to that. But uh, in many cases, FHA is a regular market rate. And when I say market rate, you can build a building in, in Los Angeles or in Seattle, and you can charge normal market rates. There isn't an affordable component to that, meaning it's just regular. Does FHA have an affordable uh, product? Yes, of course. Uh, so the uniqueness of the product is it's not recourse. So um, developers and uh, existing property owners can get a loan without a personal guarantee. The other thing is it's just like on the conventional residential side, it's probably about a half a percent uh, cheaper than a regular loan you can get from a bank or agencies at the same leverage. And the difference in FHA versus conventional commercial bank is that typically um, loans mature after 10 or 12 years. And even if it's amortized over 30 years, the loan has to be paid off. Or else, if it's a local bank, they'll give you a tax fix. And after 10 years, it starts to reset every year. Uh, with an FHA product, if you get an existing, uh, refinance an existing property that's already built, you have, number one, up to 35 years amortization. And there is no maturity, there is no balloon, and the rate never changes. So unlike a typical products, this one is fixed in for pretty much ever. Uh, and on the construction side, the amortization is 40 years, so you'll get a cheaper payment, therefore more cash flow for your money. And the difference is when you normally do a construction loan, uh, local banks will give you a variable rate during construction. And afterwards, when you uh, stabilize the property and you get a certificate of occupancy, you have at least 90 days of seasoning, meaning people are paying your rent, then at that point, they'll give you a permanent loan. So you basically have to refinance. Well, 24 months from now, you and I both don't know where the rates are going to be, but likely they'll be more expensive. If a trade product, you lock in the rate from day one. So you're locked in during the course of construction and for 40 years or after, so you're set. And that's a, that's a big difference. And you know, personally, uh, because we have developed properties with developers, we've borrowed both. We borrowed uh, loans that are not fixed in, and we borrowed loans that are variable. There's a there's a reason to do one or the other. It really depends on, um, the type of property you're building and really what your exit is. But I think uh, what's important is not to necessarily stick to what the product is. It's more important to understand what is your strategy. And the products we have will kind of be we we can we could present let's say to you, hey, maybe FHA is not the best product for this because you want to sell the building in a year, or maybe it is because you're just afraid of the um, potential rate hikes. So. Gotcha. That's a pretty. That's a pretty awesome loan product. That you get the. I agree. The lock, the, <laughs> the rate lock in <laughs> from the get go. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the only downside that I've heard for yeah. those FHA loans is the the construction draws, and how long those can usually take. I mean, we I've heard of guys some of the draws take like forty five days, and you know. In terms of the actual release of the money, I right. think it has to do with the servicer. And I think it has to do with, uh, let's say, lack of experience working with FHA. Right. In the day, FHA is, is an insurance policy. It's not a lender. It insures the property. And then in terms of procedures, if you know 
responsibility and you have the proper consultant on board to be able to kind of mitigate that, then you won't have as much of a problem. But I had the same issue personally with conventional banks where it took me three, four weeks to get a draw because they keep asking for one, pay for another. And uh, in many cases, I could blame the bank or I could blame myself for not knowing their procedure. And if you learn the properly, then you get to draw. You know? yeah. At the end of the day, just know the rules and adapt to it. But I think anytime you do something for the first time, it could be tedious. And, uh, you know, you get the right people to help you. Now let's go into the loan products that you guys have for, you know, for developers, you know, such as ourselves, guys that are trying to, you know, that flip houses, um, what products do you have available or what can you tell us about, you know, hard money loans and things like that, that, you know, they can utilize? Sure. Well, I think just in general, I know you guys are in different states, but in California, we're, we're, we understand the market. We've done, you know, many fix and flip properties ourselves back in the day. And now we just choose to stay on the lending side as much as possible. So we'll go to like the typical structure, 80 to 85% of the cost, as long as the future value of our actual loan amount is no higher than 65% of the future value. And we'll offer up to that amount. When I say up to 85%, it means to people that have done it. Maybe. A lot of times we get loan requests and it's a first time investor trying to do it. And we'll probably won't give them 85% or her. 85% of project costs. We'll do 75%, let's say, the first time. And then as we see experience, we see a track record, and we know that uh, the investor was successful in flipping and making money, and we're happy to, um, of course, uh, give them a higher in the future. And that's 85% of all costs? or Yeah, total project costs. So let's just uh, use a typical example. The purchase price of the property is $200,000, and the rehab budget is fifty. So that's two hundred and fifty. So we'll lend, let's say, 80% of two fifty, And then the money that's meant for the rehab would be held back and released in draws. And you do those, you do those on reimbursement, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it could be a reimbursement or, or it could be a you know, check paid to a vendor up front. So let's say they have a general contractor lined up and the initial draw is 15000 for material. We'll release that money to the GC. And then once we see progress, we'll release the rest of them. Gotcha. You know, in in a pre-negotiated uh, release course. mechanism. Gotcha. And then as and far as and then as far as points and interest, like does it obviously vary? You know, be like for experience, like for somebody who's in the beginning stages, what do you guys do for interest and points? And for somebody sure. who's a little more experienced, what do you guys do for? Uh, it really depends on the leverage. So the rates all start. Right. Everyone will tell you the same thing. We're at, we start at eight percent. The percent that's usually at a fifty-five percent loan to value. You know, and so you go up to 80, 85%, you're looking at rates between nine and percent with probably about three points. That includes a functional. And then um, that's pretty much it. But as you do with, with an individual, then of course that's all negotiable. And it depends on the deal size because you put the same amount of effort into a uh, $250,000 loan as you went into a million dollar loan. So, um, and it depends on the term of the loan. If you're, right. somebody needs a good year, then maybe the fees are a little more. If someone needs about six months to quickly get in and out of a deal, the fees are a little less. Gotcha. Okay. All right, and in, go ahead, man. Did you, right, right. I, um, you mentioned that you had done some flips in the past. Can we can we talk a little bit about that and why you don't why you don't um, you know you said you don't do them anymore or there's not enough margin. <laughs> <laughs> time, that's just simple the simple answer the reason why you know we used to do a lot of fix and flips we used to buy distressed properties uh, and that was in, in different parts of los angeles and california but when we saw the margins and again uh, my definition of margin and, and other people's definition of margin might be very different and uh probably we're a lot more conservative than other people that are doing it now what and, were you guys uh, looking at before um Pretty large margins, meaning that if, if, if uh, we used to buy properties, initially we started in, in areas like San Bernardino, uh, Palmdale, Lancaster. You know, you, you buy a house for, let's say, $100,000, spend twenty, and then resell it for $180,000, $200,000. Those were good margins, and it, it made sense to do them. Now I notice people, uh, you know, buying properties for $500,000 to spend 50000 to maybe make seventy five. You know, the market is 15%, you're done. You know, so we'd rather be on the lending side of it because there's much less risk than not. And it's also the, the amount of effort you have to put forth uh, onto a project like that to, to make that kind of money. And it's just not worth it. Not not for us, you know. But, uh, yeah, we, we started in, in rough areas, um, uh, areas that a lot of people, you know, 
didn't want to touch and those had the best opportunities. In hindsight, we should have bought everything at market value back in 09 there and we would have all made. But uh, we were conservative then, we're conservative now. And I think for us, the, the strategy is always that if I'm more or less uh, investing in 30% below the market and I have a wave like this, right? And then I'm always under that wave. And I have a little flat line that comes across. So if I'm a little below or above the flat line as an average portfolio, we're always above the market. Right. So, you know, if, if I'm not saying that I would have never built to a 7% yield, um, you know, uh, in 2009, 2010, uh, but it would have been smart to buy land. And maybe in the next cycle, we'll buy some land park it and, and uh, wait for the next opportunity. But at that time, you buy properties below what it would cost to build them. It's the bill, right? Now, those same properties are significantly more than, you know, it's worth to build them. And that's why we're building. And I think, uh, you know, we've, we've sold a lot of our properties that were, in the, that were older. We uh, traded them into better projects, you know, that were uh, apartment buildings that we built and we kept. And uh, I think in the next cycle, when the market tanks again, inevitably it will, because, you know, it's like a big wave, uh, we'll buy those assets again and hold on. So I see that you do uh, mezzanine uh, financing. When I was at the Pitbull conference, they had said after the crash that that kind of had became non-existent and it just started mm-hmm. popping up again recently in the last like year or two. Can you attest to that? And then also for our listeners who aren't familiar with what mezzanine financing is, kind of go um, into a little bit more detail about that and you know, how, to, sure. how that works with you? Well, I think uh, people use a lot of those words interchangeably and everybody has their own meaning. But I think the idea of preferred equity or mezzanine financing is uh, essentially you're taking the property as collateral. You take the interest in the company as collateral in return for that. And many times it's done because the senior holder, the, the first mortgage lender, uh, doesn't want any seconds recorded against the property. So we do both first and second mortgages just as a practice if we understand the first mortgage. If we understand, because um, there's certain uh, first mortgages in the commercial world that where the pre penalty can be quite hefty. Uh, there's a pre payment penalties that are called yield maintenance or defeasance, where you know the pre payment penalty could be as much as a million or two million dollars because it's a 10 year lock of a guaranteed payment, you know. And so, we would probably not do a second in that. But if you have a second mortgage that we're doing behind a bank, we know that the pre payment penalty is let's say two percent. Well, that's an easy quantifiable number. Let's say we do a a five hundred thousand dollar mortgage behind a million dollar loan. Well, two percent of that is a million twenty, right? So I know that I can add and make it a million twenty behind the second mortgage we're doing and calculate my true loan to value. Uh, as in, is very much like that. You essentially take the interest in the LLC as a collateral for your repayment. So instead of recording a second mortgage, you take the shares as your collateral. So in the, in the event the borrower defaults, you essentially end up owning. Uh, the LLC, which owns a property, as opposed to foreclosing on the actual property itself. Gotcha. So that's it's basically the same structure, but uh, as long as you have attorneys that can properly pick it up, and you, it's a very similar instrument in terms of uh, foreclosing on the actual property. And yeah, it, I think it dried up because I think a lot of mezzanine lenders uh, were just like in the in the real estate residential bubble, they were just too aggressive. I don't think it ever really went away. I just think it morphed into something more conservative. And because those same mezzanine lenders were able to buy assets, they weren't interested in making, you know, 12, 13% returns on the money. Now that they can't, they're putting the money back out there. It's a normal cycle. <laughs> so, so now you're talking about, you know, you're talking about the market, right? Like how, uh-huh. how it moves and ebbs and flows. What are your thoughts on the current state of the market? I know uh, where are you guys are. You're in California, right? Yeah, we're in, we're in Los Angeles. Area. Uh, what do you guys land at? Like, you know, what markets are you guys in? Uh, we're in several markets. We're in, mostly on the West Coast. Uh, but, you know, I, I grew up on the East Coast. I grew up in, in a place called Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, which, unlike Los Angeles, is real America. You know, <laughs> I keep saying the story. My dad bought a house for whatever, $100,000 and it's still hundred and ten. you know, 20 years later. It just doesn't go up. It doesn't go down, doesn't go up. Right. It's inflation. And those are stable, stable markets. So LA, I, I can't tell you as a stable market. I, I don't think it is. It has uh, big, up, big ups and big downs, but it's a big attraction to money everywhere uh, only because everybody knows Hollywood, you know, and, and San Francisco, you know, where, where else are you going to go? It's just a locked in land, you know? So, but for me, other markets are, are interesting, you know, Washington, Oregon, 
uh, Texas uh, was interesting until California spoiled it because they had nowhere to go but south. And so uh, it's it's one of those situations where where do I think the market is going? I don't know. It's it should have gone down already many many years ago, but it hasn't. So and uh, you know if you look at cap rates, uh, and I don't know if your audience is really familiar with what cap rates are, but a cap rate is a, is is an equivalent to what is my cash on cash return on a property if I buy a cash? So right. if I buy the property for a million dollars and I'm making thousand dollars a year, well, my cap rate is 4%. And that's what Californians are used to. What, what shocks me is that the interest rates on longer term money, not a five-year fix, but let's say a 10-year fix. Well, it's very close to 5%. So essentially, you're buying a building that's making you 4% with the hope that in the future it makes you more money, but you borrow money from a bank at 5%. Well, if you're a billionaire and you don't care, you're buying it for cash and 4% is good enough for you, be my guest. But if you're borrowing money from a bank and you're buying, you're borrowing money at a higher rate than what the building is making you, it's a wrong investment strategy. Well, at that point, you're kind of investing just for uh, appreciation because then you hope that the, uh, the cap rate and the appreciation combined surpasses, you know, the, the debt that you're paying on it. Not quite. I think you're, you're hoping that your rents will go up. So you can have appreciation because uh, look at it from this perspective. If you know that the rent are X, right, and your value is Y. In the commercial world, equity is generated by cash flow. Whereas in the residential world, yeah, the house can be uh, going up in value because, you know, the school district has become better. So people are flocking to that area because of good schools. It's more kitchen. I'm in love with the bathrooms of this house and I'm willing to pay equity. In the commercial world, it's very much driven by cash flow. So there, no matter what you do, if your rents go down, your property value goes down. If the rents go up, your property goes up. So in the commercial world, it's, it's quite different residential. Nobody falls in love. Well, there's some trophy assets, but even trophy assets, like those downtown sky, skyscrapers in New York, you know, they still make you at least a three, three and a half percent return where you could buy a really nice house in, in, in the Beverly Hills that will make you zero. So. <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, what are your most active markets, you know, just for, uh, for, you know, people wondering, like, where are you guys lending the most? Like for, uh, well, because we're California based, we do a lot of business in California. Uh, we also do a lot of business in Washington and Texas. Uh, but we're probably more than 50% of our business is still California just because we are, you know, we're locally here. We have this office here and we also have an office in Mississippi. So on your commercial loans, like what, um, like what factors are you looking at to decide if you're going to lend on it, you know, say with the, the cap, you know, cap rate or NOI or the um, debt service coverage ratio, like what are your kind of minimums that you look for? And then what are, um, you know, what's considered good in your eyes for uh, those factors that you're looking at? Depends on the bucket we're going to put it into. Right. So if we're, if we're doing, let's say an FHA loan, uh, then we have a debt service constraint of 1.18, meaning that let's say if you're, um, if your maximum, if your mortgage payment is supposed to be ten thousand dollars a month, your income needs to be net income eleven thousand eight hundred, right? So you always need to make more money than what your expenses. That's for conventional long-term fixed products. You know, Fannie Mae is, has a one point two debt service coverage ratio, which means that if your um, mortgage expense is ten thousand per month, your income needs to be twelve thousand dollars a month. Okay, just a, is kind of a simple, you always need to make more. Yeah, right. But sometimes what happens is we do a bridge loan because um, let's say a, a client comes in and they have uh, seven units occupied and three vacant. Well, currently the property doesn't cash flow at all. Well, what we'll do, we'll pretend that it, the future rents will be enough to cash flow because we know what the market rents are after the rehab is there. We'll hold back some money to allow the person to rehab those units and then release them. And then we'll predicate it based on what the future rental income is going to be. So we'll be able to even set aside some money as an interest reserve to allow a, an investor to do that. And then once that property is stabilized, then we could refinance. So it's kind of all over the map. It really depends on the product type. Gotcha. But on development projects, when we're investing in projects, we stress the rate quite a bit because, uh, and it really depends where, um, when we think we're going to have the property stabilized. So if we uh, put in a shovel in the ground to start building, it's likely that we won't have the property for at least for at least 18 months, you know, at least 12 to 16 months for construction. And depending if it's one building, several buildings, it'll take, you know, another three to six months to lease it up. So let's say 18 to 24 months before you can refinance. So knowing that we're two years out from a 
um, from a being able to get a permanent loan, if we don't go with the FHA product, of course, then we're going to be stressing interest rates to six, maybe even six and a half percent, because there's a potential the rates will be there. And we don't want to be negative when time comes. Hmm. I had a question. Um, where did uh, the name Forbix come from? Like, how'd you come up with that? It's a long story. <laughs> we're, we're trying to find catchy names that we really liked. And uh, we settled on the future of real estate business information exchange. So hence for. Oh, so it actually stands for something like every letter. That's, that's cool. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. We just come up with something that sounds cool. <laughs> like, we, I, we thought it sounded cool too. You know? <laughs> like our development like companies called Park Place. It just sounds like a established company. Right. On. Well, or, some of the other companies we, we manage, they actually have a, like a, um, for example, Baseline Capital is a, is a is a is a is a partnership that was supported around 2009 or 10, and it was property with all was on Baseline. So, and we like the idea of Baseline because a Baseline is kind of the foundation of everything, right? You find Baseline and you build from there. So we we thought it was a very cool and catchy name. So that's how it's done. This yeah. one's a little bit more more <laughs> more contrived. Uh, <laughs> what are some of the growing you know, for somebody that's interested in, you know, maybe moving into like the lending side, maybe not, maybe this cycle or next cycle. Uh, what are some of the growing pains that you had from the beginning, from starting the company to where you're at now, you know, when it comes to not only, you know, increasing your fund, but like, what were some of the growing pains that you guys had? <laughs> I think every business owner will tell you the same thing. The biggest growing pain is finding the right people to work. And I think that's been my biggest challenge because, you know, you have this vision and you, and you have to understand, I think early on that you, you have a certain skill set and I might be really great at uh, accounting. You know, I'm, I'm great with experts, but I have zero idea of how to design. So I need to be able to go to a designer to design it. So it's right. about uh, giving up control because I'm a control freak. And I'll admit it here on your podcast. Uh, besides that, it's the people. But once you can afford to hire the right people, to do the right job, and it's not so much um, uh, their experiences. I think it's their relevant experience to how you run your company, because they might have worked for a bank for you know ten or twenty years, and they will do great at bank, but they'll do terrible in an organization like this. Quite a bit versatile, Smaller. and exactly, and just there's a lot of um, uh, investor-minded. Uh, opportunistic type of approaches to doing real estate deals versus just a bank mentality. And I think that's what we bring to the table, myself and my partners, that, you know, we've been there, we've done that. We've borrowed money personally. We know what it feels like uh, to not get rent payments. We know what it feels like to have to evict the tenant. Uh, yeah. uh, we understand what it's like to still have to make a mortgage payment when that happens, you know? Even more and, in California, how I've heard it's like almost impossible to evict a tenant over there. I think the East Coast is way worse. <laughs> you know, <laughs> judicial states are actually worse than the, you know, the trustee states. Or you know, but yeah, California is a tenant-friendly uh, state. Um, that's true, absolutely true. But I think uh, you have to do your fair share of uh, due diligence when you lease out to a tenant. And if they're right. bad when you started, they'll probably be bad when uh, you, you leave. And so, but uh, you know, we haven't we haven't had too much trouble with with that. You know, we we we've had some issues when the market was bad. Uh, with some evictions and that's not paying, but that, that's a normal uh, time of the market. What was uh, what was your what was your vision when you guys? How many part? Wait, actually, how many partners are there in Forbex? Three. How many? Three. Okay. Uh, what Three was partners. what was your guys's vision when you first started, and has it changed to where you're at now? And how have you adjusted to what has changed to? Sure. I think the scale changed, right? So I think when we first started, that we had this coping of idea of keeping everything under one roof and being able to be versatile. I think we did just that. But I think like any business, you you evolve with it. And uh, it's not that I said, oh, I'm going to buy this building in this geographical location, because as much as it might be the right set of circumstances, it's the wrong partners in that particular deal. When an opportunity presents itself and you have a vision and you're ready for it and your eyes are wide open, then you see it. But if you, you know, you, if, until you, you know, let's say driving down the street and you're, you're, you just got a red car. I don't have a red car, but I'm just being facetious. <laughs> and it's 20 red cars in the street, right. but until you, you start to look for them, they're not there, you know? And I think it's a thing in real estate. If you're not open to the type of approach uh, of how you're going to invest or the kind of partners you're looking for, um, it's just not going to be there. You know, the, a lot of our uh, property investments came, came from making loans. We offered to make a loan on a property and then, the buyer back down. They're like, hey, do 
you want it? The answer was, sure, why not? And yeah. that evolved. But did I think that that would happen on a particular deal? No. It just kind of happened and you roll with the punches and you um, take advantage of the opportunities that are presented to you. And, you know, it, it's, it's not coming from a place of uh, just I'm trying to make a deal work. You never want to do it for the sake of the deal. It has to be just the right set of circumstances. And um, But to answer your question, no, I didn't think we would be doing exactly what we're doing today, but I was hoping we would. Nice. Matt? Oh, I had a question. I just lost it. <laughs> <laughs> Matt handles the uh, the finance side of our business because, you know, like you were saying, right, you got to be good at – you get, you you're – end up doing what you're best at, right? Or should be mm-hmm. focusing on what you're best at and right. what you're not good at, then your partners take care of that. Um, you know, him, bo- him, bo- you hope so. <laughs> but hopefully you have complimentary partners that are, right. they, have, they have strengths where you have weaknesses and vice versa. Sure. So him having an accounting background and a finance background, you know, he's able to talk and, you know, he, he handles the finance side of the business. So I thought that, you know, this would be a perfect uh, opportunity to have you on the podcast. So, uh, Matt, do you have any questions like finance related? Um, no, or, not right now. <laughs> but no, yeah, okay. Uh, I remember my question. Uh, where do you go. see Forbix going in, um, you know, what's your plan for the future for the next few years? Uh, kind of your vision and your goals that you want to get to? You know, we're, we're involved in a, in a few unique projects kind of uh, on a nationwide scale. So I, you know, my, my goal right now is to kind of finish out those projects because they're in different st- stages of construction. So we have about, uh, I think, 300 units that are under construction now uh, in different projects. And then we have another, I want to say, another 300 probably uh, pegged for 2008 in different partnerships. And some of them are, are really great locations uh, in San Francisco, Mill Valley, uh, other parts of Washington and Olympia. And um, I really want to finish off those projects, get them stabilized, and then kind of sit. Because I, I really do believe that and I've been saying this every year, the last five years, and every year I've been wrong. The market will change. And maybe it's the uh, interest rate hikes, but so far I haven't seen that uh, change the marketplace yet. Uh, maybe it will in the next six months or a year. Uh, or maybe it will be you know, during the next election. Who knows? And I think time will tell. But I want to wrap those projects up and probably less construction. And I kind of sit on the sidelines, stabilize the portfolio, and then wait for the next downturn to buy those assets again. You know, uh, buy again, you know, real estate properties that are in in distress or buy the non-performing notes. And um, because we do a lot of uh, private lending, uh, you know, we have capital that we deploy in that direction because there's nothing to buy. But the beautiful thing about investing in private capital is that when the money does come back, and it usually comes back every six months to 18 months, you're able to either do more private loans or you can reinvest it in projects. So that's my vision for, you know, in the next uh, 18 to 24 months. What's been uh, what's been your favorite project that you guys have funded so far? Because so, you do a lot of bigger stuff, so I'm just curious. Like, what's uh, what's your favorite? I think project? There's, there's two projects right now that I really like just because of their unique nature. Uh, one of them is a, is a project in Olympia, Washington, which is right across the, uh, I guess, bay from uh, uh, the Capitol building. Olympia is the, is the state capital of, of Washington, mm-hmm. and this this project is a nine story tower that was an office building. We have a great partner on the ground uh, named Ken who uh, picked it up, you know, basically redeveloped it to change it into um, a nine-story high-rise apartment building where we're essentially converting the existing office use into uh, an apartment building project. And then we're building next to it um, uh, additional units with an automated parking garage. And the beautiful thing about it is that, I don't know if you guys know what Los Angeles is, or in Marina Del Rey, there's an area, it's basically a bunch of harbors and boats. And on one side, you see beautiful boat docks on the other side you see the state capitol and it's right on this peninsula um, in downtown and it's a great beautiful location the views from it are amazing so that's one project that I, one project that when it's finished uh, i'll be very proud of it we actually started construction already and uh, we hope to be done in the next uh, nine to ten months and uh, the other project that we just acquired the land and are going to be building it with also great partners on the ground in um, in uh, san francisco that is a project that is uh, 224 uh, residential units and 20,000 square feet of commercial space, also nice. on the water, in the Hunters uh, Point shipyard area, where you know Lunar has developed a lot of condominiums and uh, uh, already. So they created infrastructure. So it's kind of like we're we're going in there, uh, having 
already had somebody else kind of pave the way. And uh, we're going to be developing that project, and we hope to break ground in um, 2019, um, hopefully September, October. And it's going to have two components to it, uh, a piece that we will probably keep for some time, and then 50 condominiums are going to sell uh, for profit. And all of those units are also with great views of downtown San Francisco and the Bay, and it's, it's an amazing project. So th those are the two that I guess I'm excited about right now. Um, that uh, I'm nervous but excited. You know, we, we can't <laughs> wait to finish them and uh, and stabilize them. Yeah, for the same reasons I noted earlier. It's uh, but because they're so unique, because those projects are in such amazing locations, I think that um, irrelevant in the situation, you know, weather the storm, e even in a downward um, environment. So we're past just doing the projects, you know, in our backyard to do it for the sake of building. We're we're trying to find unique sites that we think uh, are unique and will sustain the economic downturn. Hmm. Let me ask you, what um, what's your like bread and butter everyday like project that you either you look to you know fi you know finance or that you you know you buy as an investment? Like, what does that look like as far as like you know uh, you know multifamily or commercial property? You know, just, uh, for us to buy, you mean? Uh, we, yeah. don't, we don't buy or finance. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, sorry. Buy. Buy. Uh, buy probably an apartment project, something with value add, hopefully half vacant that we can either rehab and reposition. Or else it's a great piece of land that is ready to go vertical. And uh, those are the projects that we're doing. And they typically, you know, if it's local, you know, we just finished an eight-unit property in Hollywood uh, that was, a, you know, it took us about uh, a year. And uh, that's that was a great project that we bought that I thought has, you know, great upside and great potential. But uh, typically, if it's outside of the Los Angeles area, then, you know, we probably want to do 50 units plus or 80 units plus because of the scale, you know, to get the right team uh, in place to actually buy and develop, you need to have the, the ability to scale. You need to be able to hire a large professional management company, uh, nice crews where you can save on costs. Otherwise, doing projects out of state is, is quite difficult. Hmm. For financing, you know, if we're in Los Angeles, it's really, really, or not Los Angeles, in California, we'll do anything from $100,000 plus to whatever, 50, 60 million. It, it doesn't matter. We'll do all sorts of projects, both residential and commercial um, in, in the California area. But if we go out of state, our minimum loan amount would be $1 million. Again, for scaling purposes. Huh. Let me ask you, how did you first get into, like how long have you been in the lending, in lending industry? And like, how did you first get started? And you know, like what, you know, why real estate? Why real estate? I was working uh, for a, uh, a, a stock and bond advisory firm. Uh, or market advisory firm, and then um, I realized that you know I didn't really like that that much, and uh, I realized that everyone that ever makes money, whether you're a doctor or a lawyer, uh, or you're a, uh, a business person, you ultimately end up investing that money in real estate. So I realized that people go and make their money elsewhere, and then go and invest in real estate. So I'm like, why wouldn't I just skip that step? Why don't I just go into real estate and make the money there? So it's kind of funny. <clears throat> it was around Christmas time. And I answered an ad in the, in the, I think LA Times to, to be a receptionist slash administrative assistant. That was in 2001. And uh, a great lady that ended up becoming my partner hired me for that job. Uh, and uh, her and I had a great tenure run. And uh, we, you know, that was my, that was my start of real estate. But I actively saw, saw, you know, saw, sought it out. And, um, and I knew that that's what I wanted to do. How did you work your way up, though, from... Uh, from that to being a partner, <laughs> I think just uh, <laughs> as any any employee out there in the world, I think you you uh, you reap what you sow, right? So whatever you put into it, you get out. I think she saw the that I was valuable to her. I helped her create the automation infrastructure, and uh, I think she saw that I had a knack for it. And uh, ultimately, she offered me the position, and um, and I continued to grow with her for many many years. And you know we are still great friends and uh, it just, it just worked. Nice. But yeah. I think if you work your butt off <laughs> uh, and you know, eventually somebody will recognize your, your valuable part of the team and they'll offer, you know, if you are nice and you're, uh, I don't know, conscientious and you show up and you work your butt off and you're in the office 12 hours a day, you know, <laughs> that's the, that's the one part that you can't skip. <laughs> right. They say, right. Musician, singer, whatever you got to put in your, what, a thousand hours, something like that. Yes. Well, I, yeah, you can't skip that part. And you, I think, and it's hard to put in a quality 
10,000 hours into anything unless you're really passionate about what you do. So my biggest suggestion is if you don't love real estate, don't get into it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Matt, did you want to go into the, the questions part here? Or uh, we're at the 45 minute mark. Yeah, I got, uh, well, I got one more question before I ask more questions. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> is that a double um, negative? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, so for people that aren't familiar with like, you know, lenders, what, uh-huh. Like, how do you, how'd you get the initial, you know, money together or where do you get the funds from to then lend out uh, for deals? Like, how does that, the backside of it, you know, work that, you know, everybody that's, you know, on the ground doesn't see, you know, uh, if you can kind of explain that structure. The capital raise? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, well, first to have a mortgage bank, you need to put in money, right? You have to, yeah, there's certain uh, cash requirements, net worth requirements, liquidity requirements. It really depends what part of the business you plan. So if you're running a mortgage bank or you open one up, you need to have cash because you need to get bonding, licenses, et cetera, et cetera. If you're just acting as a mortgage broker, it's very little. Um, but if you're acting as a lender, it's quite a bit more. Now, in terms of raising capital, well, I think it goes back to the same old methodology. You got to work your butt off. You got to get people to invest with you from before in different projects and they have to trust you with their money. And so ultimately, uh, the way that we do most of our private loans is that we make them ourselves and we were in that business with our own personal cash by working our butts off and making money. Uh, and then we would sell those notes to our investors and continue to service them. So you basically free up your own capital and you lend it out again. And that's how we started on a small scale and that, that small scale began to grow more and more and more. There's no, uh, there's no shortcut. You know, you have to build relationships and you have to be good to people and you have to make sure that you don't lose their money. Nice. Yeah. So you just scale and then you continue to raise more money and then it just, you build it up. Now it helps if your dad is like a billionaire, he'll just give you 20 (laughs) million bucks. I didn't have that kind of dad. Love my dad to pieces, but you know, we didn't come for money. We, you know, he's an engineer, my mom engineer, and you know, anything I've done here, I did on my own. So. That's awesome. Okay. um, I'm going to do the questions now. What habits helped make you successful? Uh, my habits, I think my, my biggest happy is a habit is I'm always starving for knowledge, right? So I'm very, very curious. And I think when somebody gives me something that doesn't make sense to me until it does, I, I can't let it go. I can't drop the book until it makes sense to me. And, uh, as a suggestion to other people, if something that somebody's pitching, it doesn't make sense. Don't do it. So, <laughs> so uh, you were talking earlier about one of the things that you had, a. Uh you know, overcome as, you know, as you scaled and, you know, grew your, your business was hiring the right people and putting the right people in place. What, mm-hmm. What's your best hiring tip or secret that you learned along the way, you know, going through that process and, you know, scaling from to the, you know, the employee count you are right now? I think what I've learned is that I used to try to fill positions and I just try to hire good people. And, uh, you know, you might have a perfect position that you need to fill, but you get it, you meet a great person that isn't necessarily perfect for that position but they can do a part of that position, a part of another one, and you hire them because they're a good employee or you think they'll be a great employee, you know? Uh, and I look for the same type of things. I want energy. I want them to be um, logical. That is that is the toughest thing I've been able to, to find is, is, is to find people that are logical. And uh, because, you know, my logic and their logic might be different, but it's the common sense that I think is important in, in an application and how to properly apply it. Because everything else, if they have common sense, you can teach. And I think uh, the biggest suggestion I have for whoever's listening is find people with great common sense, with a great work ethic, and a very, really positive attitude. I've learned early on, I don't want to show up to the office who I work with. So you want to surround yourself with positive people, and then you'll put out the, you know, you'll have the right vibe within your office to be able to, um, you know, enjoy it. How do you test for common sense, though? Like, you ask them what's five times twelve, and you hope they say sixty. <laughs> uh, you know, it's more. No, I mean, I'm just. I, think right. we, we don't, I don't have like a. I don't. I don't open up a book like the old school and say, "Hey, you know, where was your last job?" And it, you know, it becomes more of a dialogue the way you and I are speaking. And the moment you get a person to get comfortable with you, and you're, I guess, I'm giving my own secrets now. Now, now the employees will hold back. <laughs> uh, but you, you want him to open up. You want them to tell you about themselves, about where they've been, where they're going, pros and cons. And um, and I think then you kind of get to know the person because it's really hard to interview a person because everybody puts on the best show. It's like going, I guess, on a dating website. You get the best picture of yourself, the best angle, right? Uh, I haven't been on one for about 17 years, but <laughs> that's what I hear from my friends. 
So this question is, you know, have you ever turned down a client? And I know in your business, you know, you turn down, turn down clients all the time for not meeting <laughs> certain, you know, financial requirements or whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, was there ever an instance where you turned someone down? Like they kind of, everything lined up, like the qualifications or the requirements, but mm-hmm. did you turn them down for a different reason? Like was it, there was just like something about them where you didn't feel like you could trust them with? In character. Yeah. Yes. It's happened. And I think oftentimes, you know, what's funny is when we see a file that is too perfect, there's something wrong with it, you know, and you have the sixth sense uh, uh, that you, there's some, you know, I think once you see enough files, uh, you're, you realize that something doesn't add up, like something is way too clean. There's absolutely no blemish with this file. So you start digging in until you find that one issue that's a problem. Uh, but oftentimes, yeah, if somebody uh, talks out of both sides of their mouth within a conversation or in writing, uh, typically, we don't want to go down that path because it just means the person's dishonest, and uh, I don't care how great the deal is. It's it's happened on more than one occasion. Like they uh, they oversell themselves by talking too much, and you're like, why are they trying to convince me so badly? There must yeah, be something. It's not that. I think it's just you know, when the stories conflict, or if somebody's purposely uh, with because they know they they're telling you everything you want to hear. The best clients are the ones that tell you everything up front, and they let you solve the problem. Because typically, when you give us all the variables, we'll inevitably find a solution that works. And there will be a solution. Maybe it requires you to bring in 10% more of a down payment, but there is a solution. But when people uh, try to withhold facts, such as you know how much you actually paid for the property, or the real party behind it, or you know it, it just it runs the wrong way, and you know that you know that now you're wondering what else are they not talking about. But it's never because they talk too much or they're over eager. Sometimes just the nature of the circumstance. And I, I try to be open, but uh, you know, you got to sniff out the BS. So yeah, I'm sure they've, um, you know, probably lied on their applications. What was like the biggest thing that you discovered that someone tried to, you know, defraud on their, from their profile? Usually it's background checks, navigation and issues in the past or mortgage fraud in the past. We, we have no tolerance for that. We do background checks on, on individuals, you know, Usually not the LOI stage, but shortly thereafter, and we tell them about it, you know. And the, the biggest thing is, I think, transparency from our end. We tell people up front, you know, it, it, we don't have a problem with somebody on that credit. You know, it, it's the nature of the circumstance if we hear We're obviously in the private money space. But if we know, um, you know, they've played the game with a different lender and they didn't pay in the past or they filed bankruptcy or something like that, we're going to be looking at that with quite a bigger conservative eye. Big notice is... Um, History repeats itself, both with people and with friends. And uh, people usually don't change. What, uh, what, what is one thing that you find to be true that most people would disagree with? What is, I don't even know. That's such a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess that's the intent of it, right? Uh, what, do, uh, huh, what, do one, what is one thing that I think is true that most people disagree with? Maybe in the lending space or in business in general. Well, I don't necessarily agree with, you know, only buy amazingly great areas. And I think it's just a different mindset of people that are saying that. So there's some people that, oh, let me give you a very basic one. Here, here's a good one. Um, a lot of people like to touch and feel their properties. I think that's highly rare. There's been properties that are, you know, within a 30 mile radius from me that I haven't seen in probably five years. And those properties that are, you know, 2000 miles away from me. I've seen more times in the last year than, you know, I've seen the properties that, you know, are right next door to me that I haven't touched in five years. It's, it's, a, it's kind of a, your own way of fooling yourself, thinking that because I can get to it better, it's a better investment. Um, I think that's one thing for me. I, I don't care where the property is because in, in, the, in the new age, we could fly there. And if they're the right scale, uh, it's, it's irrelevant. Yeah, I think if you're buying a house and that's the only house you have, yeah, you should probably buy it somewhere you could drive to it. But if you're actually using an investment strategy, I know a lot of old school investors that only invest in Los Angeles. They don't go anywhere else. And uh, it's worked for them. I just don't believe in that strategy if uh, the fundamentals uh, aren't there to buy it locally. Do you have a favorite failure? Is there one that sets you up for future success? Say it again? Do you have a favorite failure? Oh, yeah. I invested in Arizona and lost deposits on like five uh, condo projects. And uh, I, I learned my lesson. It was the best money I walked away from in my life because um, I walked away from it when I saw that the projects weren't finished yet and the market was beginning to turn. 
And it's a tough decision saying, yeah, I'm going to walk away from the deposit and buy the property. But it was the smartest decision I made. And yeah, it, it made me uh, rethink about effects very, very clearly. And it was my own personal money. And it, it had the ability that the lender, I'm not the lender, uh, told us verbally that they could finish a project or will finish a project in about month, ended up finishing in 24 with no penalty to them. And so yeah, in the future, I would probably, if, if it would have been uh, finished on time, we would have made money. And because it wasn't, but the market then tanked, I think 50%. I'm glad I walked. Uh, that was yeah, my so, favorite failure. <laughs> see, sometimes the best deals you do are the ones that you don't do. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We just had one of those. <laughs> there was this one. There was this. Uh, there was this one um, flip that we uh, we bought it, and then before we got started in the construction, we just put it back on the market and broke even because we didn't think it was going to sell for the amount of money that we thought it was originally going to sell for. Sure, sure. And then we backed out, sold it to somebody else. And we just saw that it sold 18 months later. So it was on the market for way too long mm -hmm. and for a lot mm -hmm. less than we originally thought. So, I mean, it's something that we broke even on, but we, you know, we didn't lose 50, 75 grand on the deal. Yeah. Cause that person bought it for, from us for like 40,000 more to no, yeah. lose. I mean, it, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. Uh, in some, some cases, I learn, right? So, I, hopefully, I'll be smarter in the next cycle, and I'll uh, fundamentally make different decisions and, and do better than we did in the last one. We did very well in the last cycle. I think we just want to be ready for the next one. But another mistake that you know we, we've made is uh, discounting how um, hard it is to manage assets abroad when they're small. So uh, my partners and I, we bought some single family homes in, in pools uh, through, you know, auctions and things like that in different parts of the country, you know, and money and uh, overall we're ahead, but we would never do it again. It was the, you know, back in the day, the, the Brock or Blackstone, wherever we did all those uh, single family homes in the kits, it was very popular back then. And then we thought we would do go into securitization, but it's really, really difficult to manage. Uh, small single family assets from abroad without a team. And we just couldn't amass enough in any one location to make it work. So that's another uh, uh, great reason why I don't do anything less than, uh, you know, a scalable model, 50 or 80 units in, in different states, just because if it's smaller than that, it's really hard to find uh, uh, a good crew and, and good management um, in order to accommodate what you're, you know, with, without making it too big of a headache. If you could start over again, what would you do differently? I'd buy everything inside in 2009 and 10. <laughs> <laughs> I think all yeah, of us would do the same. <laughs> of course. You know? No, but you know, I was so, I was so skittish and everybody was so afraid. You know, we were one of the few that were, were doing it with the, with the exception of a handful of people in some of those areas. Uh, and uh, it seemed so scary at the time, but right now I think I'll, I'll, I'll be a lot more confident in the next buy. Because again, if you buy something placement cost value, eventually the right markets it will reach at least that at least that you know if not above and in many cases um, it went double the replacement cost value um, right. so that's the reason why i think if we use the same fundamentals next time again i, I don't think we'll be buying the same type of assets maybe if we used to buy fifty thousand dollars single family homes we'll buy two hundred thousand dollar fourplexes because i i like that better you know um but i think we'll, we'll follow a similar strategy because in, in good areas, the market doesn't drop as, as badly as in bad areas. So I think the biggest margins are going to be in the, in the, in the worst pockets. And it's a sickle. We've seen it many times. You can see Zillow charts. They'll tell you the same thing. To what do you attribute your success? Uh, me being stubborn? <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think it's because I'm inquisitive. I, I like to learn. And I think it's also... Uh, my discipline from, I think, being a child. Thanks. Yeah, so that's all the questions. I just want to thank you for, uh, you know, taking time out of your schedule to for having you know, be on this episode. And where, uh, Emil, where can people find you? Um, they can find me in my office at 15260 Ventura Boulevard. <laughs> Sweet 700. My wife would tell you I'm, I'm here most of the time. Uh, <laughs> so we're in Sherman Oaks. Uh, you could, you know, our office line is 888-94-BIX. So it's 888-936-7249. Uh, you can call the office if you need to talk to me. You know, you could you could talk to me. 
uh, or if it's a residential loan request, you can ask any of the loan officers on, on staff to help you or commercial, but any sort of request or any sort of, you want to pick my brain, feel free to call. Can people apply for loans on your website? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Just go to forbix.com, uh, F-O-R-B-I-X, and there's two tabs. Uh, one is for residential, one is for commercial. And uh, there's a little tab that you can, you know, apply for an application and get an email and somebody will contact Absolutely. Cool. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, guys. Until next time, guys. And that's it for another episode of the podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. One last thing before you head off, though. Please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and leave us your thoughts on iTunes. It would really mean a lot and help us reach more people. You can also find us on Facebook at Profits Over Wages Podcast, as well as on Instagram and YouTube. Until next time.